This is chapter number one, the rise of nationalism in Europe. So we are discussing about the rise of nationalism in Europe. What is nationalism? It is called as Rashtra. That is the a kind of patriotism or the love for the region. Here is a picture which we are going to talk about a lot. So we need to understand this picture. This is prepared by Frederick Sorio in 1848. Now the picture is showing a statue, a women's statue, that is for freedom or liberty. And there are people in line, people in line with different country flags. And here we have Jesus Christ and others, you know, the they have a they are having a look on what is going on and they are shedding their blessings. So in 1848, as we just suggested, that Soryu, he was a French artist, he prepared a series of four, four prints visuals, and that was his dream for democratic and social republics. This is the first picture and this shows people of Europe and America, men and women of all ages and all the social classes, they are marching in long train and they are offering homage to this statue of liberty as they are passing by. So while the French Revolution was taking place, female figure was the a key for liberty. It was personified as a female figure. And as you see that uh, on the earth here, on the foreground, here you can see the shattered remains of symbols of absolutist. This absolutist or Nirankush, they literally means a government or system of rule that has no restraints on the power being exercised. Means there is no real role of people. So in history, the term refers to a form of monarchical uh, government that was just centralized. It used military power and it was often repressive. Sorio has a utopian vision. That is, the people of the world, they are just grouped as distinct nations identified through their flags and what they wear, that is the national costume. And if you see, the leaders here are United States and Switzerland. Why? Because these states were already, they have already became uh, nations, nation states. Though we see the France or French people as bearing the revolutionary tricolor, but uh, the Germany, it is followed by a black, red and golden flag. But this Germany, when this image was created, German peoples did not yet exist as a united nation. This is the idea or these are, this is just for the expression of liberal hopes or in 1848 in order to unify all the German speaking principalities under one nation, under democratic constitution. And then we have people from Australia in this figure, in this picture, Kingdom of Two Sicilies, uh, Lombardy, Poland, England, Ireland, Hungary, Russia. And as I just told you, from heavens, Christ, saints, angels also, they gaze upon the scene. So this is the artism of Sariu symbolizing the fraternity among the nations of the world, that is Bhaichara. So what we are going to see here is, in this discussion, uh, during the 19th century, nationalism, this content or context emerged as a force in order to bring the sweeping change in all the political and mental world of Europe. So it, it changed the world. It changed the European people, European thinking and the political regime. And then the end result of these changes or the, was the emergence of nation state that is in the place of multinational dynastic empires which ruled for years and the concept and practices of modern state 
that is the power is uh, with people that is according to this uh, image a modern state in which a centralized power exercises sovereign control over a clearly defined boundary or a territory and this had been developing over a long period of time in europe and the nation state was one in which the citizens are important not only its ruler but all will have the shared history of descent so the commonness that is the oneness did not exist for time immemorial it has come from all these struggles various actions of people and leaders so we'll see about the diverse processes or actions or events through which this national states and nationalism came into being in 19th century europe for that we have to go back to our french revolution history so the french revolution and the idea of nation as we saw this the first clear expression of this nationalism it came when in french revolution in 1789 so uh, because the french in 1789 it was the under the, under the rule of absolute monarch then by the or under the wake of french revolution the transfer of sovereignty sovereignty from monarchy to the citizen took place and then it shaped the nation or you can say the destiny of the nation so from very beginning these revolutionaries of france that is french revolutionary they uh, introduced certain measures and practices that could create a sense of collective or combined identity among these people french people for example the ideas of la patrie that is the fatherland and the le citoyen that is the citizen that is all are together they are united community and they have equal right if we uh, you know extend this a national french flag tricolor it was chosen and the estate general was changed to national assembly and new hymns were composed oaths were taken martyrs were commemorated all in the name of the nation that is nationalism and also a centralized administrative system was now in a place and it formulated uniform laws for the citizen internal custom duties and and the dues were just abolished and the weights and measures now have a uniform system the regional dialects it was they were discouraged because france french so this should become the language of the nation and they also said this revolutionary this is a very important part the revolution uh, revolutionary said or they declared that there there is a mission and they want to change the life of uh, europe uh, european people also that is they will help them to become a separate or uh, away from these monarchs and will become a nation so they will help them so this news as it just uh, you know passed by went through so the um, students and other elite members educated member they started setting up the jacobian or jacobian clubs and the activities and campaigns they all they gave way they prepared the way for the french armies and the french armies did what it moved to holland belgium switzerland and much of it in 1790s and this was a revolutionary war the french armies tried to carry out the idea of nationalism uh, to different parts of uh, you know regions near it these are the countries which are near it so i'll show you a picture which we will revisit again and this is the europe europe after the congress of vienna 1815 we'll talk about this in a short while because we'll talk about what happened here so this uh, the growing control you can say napoleon napoleon bonaparte he brought various reforms because he has already um, introduced it in france and through a return to monarchy napoleon had no doubt destroyed democracy in france but in administrative field he had incorporated certain revolutionary principles 
to make the whole system more rational and efficient. That is the Civil Code of 1804, which is called as Napoleonic Code. It just uh, took away the privileges based on birth. It established equality before the law and the uh, right of two properties also secured. And the code was exported to the regions under French control. In uh, Dutch Republic, Switzerland, Italy and Germany, he also simplified the administrative divisions. He just abolished the feudal system and also freed the peasants from the uh, all the dues, etc. Towns also, the guild restrictions on the you know working people were removed. And the transportation and communication system, they were also improved. So peasants, artisans, workers and new businessmen, they found it very appealing. And, you know, it was good for them. Now they can exchange the goods from one region to another without, and they, they can gain some profit. So this is the, these are the picture. What sh sh it shows is not everyone welcome this uh, invasion, you can say. So initially, many places like Holland, Switzerland and cities like uh, Brussels, uh, Mainz, Milan and Warsaw, the French armies were actually welcomed. They were welcomed. But soon, it turned into hostility. Because the new administrative arrangements which the Napoleon has brought in did not go in hand with political freedom. There was increase or increment in the taxation, censorship. Uh, Ford's conscription in the French armies uh, required to conquer the rest of Europe. So there were more disadvantages than the advantages as people see it. So this picture shows it all. This is a painting of Tree of Liberty in Zurichen. You can just, uh, you know, it's a difficult word. So I'm just uh, Zwebricken. This is a place in Germany. And here, if you see, the, the painter wanted to tell that the, the French came and they are doing what? They are seizing a, seizing a peasant a cart. You, women are being harassed. A peasant is forced down to his knees. So the things were not very good because the revolutionaries came with the idea that they will, they will spread their idea. But they were doing something else. And if you see here, this is the courier of Rhineland loses all he has on his way home to Leipzig. Napoleon, he lost in, in uh, he's actually, he lost in Leipzig and he's returning back. So all these papers you see, these letters which are dropping out, this bear the name of all the territories he lost. Hey, go back and see the map of Europe mid 18th century. The nation states which we uh, know, they were not. So we'll see the making of or how this uh, nationalism shaped up in Europe. What we know today as the countries like the Germany, Italy and Switzerland, they were not these countries, but they were divided into certain parts like kingdoms, the duchies, the cantons. And there were different rulers and uh, we can say autonomous rulers and territories they rule. And most of these uh, autocratic monarchies, they were uh, having diverse people. That means different type of people were there. And they don't have any commonality between them. It means no collective identity or the culture is common. There is, there is nothing common. And even the languages were different. Ethnic groups were different. The Habsburg, if you take the empire Habsburg, this rule over Austria-Hungary, we'll just take an example. It was just a patchwork, you can say, of different regions and people. Different peoples and regions were Alpine regions, the Tyrol, Austria and the Southern Tenland, as well as the Bohemia. Where we have uh, the aristocracy, it was predominantly German speak. The Italian speaking provinces were also there, like Lombardy and Venetia. And in the Hungary side, half of the population spoke Magyar. Others, they have different dialects. In Galicia, they, the aristocracy, 
they generally speak Polish. Besides these three dominant groups, as we just saw, there are also different, you know, say, mass of people, peasant people, like Bohemians and Slovaks in north, uh, Slovenes in Carniola, Croats in south, Romans in the east, or to the east in Transylvania. So they don't have any, you can say, the unity or commonness only, we, we cannot uh, have a political unity at that time. The only thing was that they have a single emperor and these diverse group, they just uh, believe in this emperor and they trust him. That is the only thing which can be there. So, knowing about this, how this nationalism, that is the love for the country, love for the region, an idea about the love for the uh, for the state, how this came into being and the nation state, that is a combined area or a region for the combined people or this how it came into being. So, before we go ahead, let me tell you some important dates. Some of them we have already seen, some we are going to see. That is in 1797, Napoleon invades Italy and Napoleonic War begin. Then 1814 to 1815, uh, Napoleon uh, was, you can say, um, he encountered the defeat and then Vienna peace settlement was there. We'll talk about this Vienna peace settlement. Then 1821, there was a Greek struggle for independence it started. In 1848, a revolution in Europe, artisans, industrial workers, peasants, they revolt against the hardships, economic hardships, the middle classes demand constitutions and the representative governments. They want that. Italian, Germans, the Magyars, Poles, Czechs, which we talked about, they demanded nation states. In 1859 to 1870, between this time, unification of Italy took place and from 1866 to 1871, unification of Germany took place. By the 1905, Slav nationalism gathers force in the Habsburg and Ottoman empires. We just talked about Habsburg, the Habsburg Empire. So the aristocracy and new middle class. What is, what is this new middle class? The aristocracy or you can say the big people, they were socially and politically both dominant class at that time. And the members of this aristocracy class they were they were having certain things in common that is they would have great estates countrysides and they have town houses uh, generally they speak french and they uh, have marriage you can say relationship between them but these numerically these people were less major population was uh, farmers and peasants and if you see, bulk of the land was formed by tenants and small owners. If you go to the eastern part and central Europe, this pattern of land holding, it was characterized or categorized by vast estates. And who are cultivating them? Serfs. That is the people who are bounded laborers, you can say, who have to work for, for their living. And they are under the control of the, uh, the person who owns that land. Then if we go to the western and uh, western parts of central Europe. Industrial production. There was a growth of Indian uh, industrial production. And this means that the commercial class is now into being. Because the market was there. The production was there. But it as uh, against the England industrialization that happened in the second half of 18th century, in France and parts of Germany, this industrial revolution started or industrialization started during the 19th century only. And because of this, certain new, uh, certain special groups were being formed or the working class population, the middle class made up the industrialists, the businessmen and professionals. So these, uh, as I said, these groups were smaller in number till 19th century. Uh, educated, liberal middle classes. In these kind of people, these kind of uh, group of people, 
the idea of national unity national unity came into being this become popular and then they wanted or the idea of just stopping or abolition of aristocratic privileges which which was there for a long time gained popularity this was the idea of national unity and stopping of all these uh, privileges to people uh, who are enjoying them for long how did liberal nationalism stand for i'll just give you an example liberal means i'll just give you an example because this word is going to come again and again that is uh, say someone wants some your uh, neighbor wants to do something on your fence you say okay you do it i'm i'm uh, i'm liberal enough to allow you to do that and if you have a bike or if you are a cycle and you are grown up now you want to give the si bicycle and somebody comes and you just give him he asks you that how much money i have to make you say no i don't want the money you just take it so like you are you are liberal this is the sense of liberal so the ideas of national unity it is very much closely uh, related with the idea of li liberalism that is this liberalism is the basic root for this national unity how this liberalism word has come from this has come from latin uh, latin word liber liber means free what this new middle class as, as we just said this because of the industrialization this new middle class came up and the idea of uh, liberalism, liberalism for them was freedom for everyone and equality of everyone before the law right that is if all all are in consent then only the government should be formed that is polit politically they have this idea since the french french revolution this liberalism was what this is just to end the autocracy all the privileges which were there it needs to be stopped and a constitution and this is to be represented by the by the people through parliament and also various other things were there but the equality before the law did not necessarily stand for universal suffrage that is the right to vote because even after the french revolution took place the suffrage or the right of vote was only given to the to the to the people uh, who are at least paying 3 days of labor or wages as taxes to the government like other other men and especially women were excluded from all these uh, voting rights it uh, when jacobian rule came everyone was given the right to vote but after that napoleon came and it again went to the same thing that is only the privileges privileged people can give the vote especially the women were uh, abstained because they were su supposed to have the authority of fathers and husbands people just uh, you know they they thought and they organized for the opposition but uh, it took a long time to actually get uh, everyone to get the suffrage when we come to economic sphere that is where money is involved where trade is involved where exchanging of uh, trade the goods and stuff and money is uh, involved so liberalism liberalism here means that the state has imposed certain restrictions on the movement of goods and capital so the liberalism here means abolition stopping of all this i'll just give an example that german speaking region in the first half of the 19th century napoleon uh, did so many things for administrative restructuring or administrative measures but because while he was doing this he has created countless small principalities or confederation of around 39 states all these states they have their own currency that is one may have some for example one may have some rupees one may have some dollar one may have some yen for example i'm just giving an example and weights and measures some may have kg as the weighing weighing uh, measure somewhere it may be pound so if you take an example of a merchant a simple merchant he is traveling in 1833 from hamburg to nuremberg he has to pass through 11 11 custom barriers and he has to pay 5% custom duty at each time 11 times see 5% 11 times that is on this is not all everywhere the weight and measurement was different 
and it was time consuming calculation also because the weight and measure were different and they were loss for example if if a merchant is taking a cloth uh, say was it was called le in uh, which is uh, each region stood for different length now this l or le of te textile uh, material if you take that time in frankfurt you will get 54.7 cm of cloth if you go to mains 55.1 cm nuremberg 65.6 cm uh, freiburg 53.5 cm so there was a vast difference of the calculation all, only and if you take if a merchant is having lot of uh, l then you can see that how much he is going to lose and these were the condition which the liberals they, they understand that these are the obstacles we uh, they wanted a unified uh, combined economic area regime or territory and all these goods people and capital movement should be uh, should be smooth unhindered so in 1834 a custom union or you can call it as a zollverein it was formed by and the in initiative was taken by uh, prussia and it was joined by most of the german states and the they abolished the traffic barriers also reduced the number of currencies it was uh, 30 at that time but it was just reduced to 2 also the network of railways was good and this stimulated or this enhanced the mobility and that is how there was a interest or idea of national unification so these are the sentiments how the economic nationalism came from the sentiments of national unity there is a word conservatism this this is a political philosophy that stresses the importance of tradition that is all the things which are going on in the past and still going on this needs to be uh, given more most uh, more importance than others and established institutions and customs those were traditional uh, or going on for long time and prefer gradual development of quick change so a new conservatism after 1851 uh, 1815 it emerged so when napoleon was defeated in 1815 now these european governments they have a spirit of conservatism rudivadita these conservatives they they have a the idea that the traditional institution of the state and society which are going on like monarchy church social hierarchies between different uh, categories of people the property and the family these all needs to be preserved and most conservatives this conservatism most conservatives they don't want to go to the those uh, pre revolutionary days because they have realized that the modernization could in fact strengthen the traditional institution like the monarchy that they want to have again so it may, it, it could make a state more powerful that is effective and strong so this is how they thought that a modern army an efficient bureaucracy and a dynamic economy and the feudalism uh, abolition the uh, bhudasatva that is serfdom this could be stopped and it can strengthen the autocratic monarchies that they want to have of europe so in 1815 there was uh, certain powers european powers who beat napoleon that is britain russia prussia and austria they sat together in vienna and uh, to draw up a settlement for europe and this was hosted by the austrian chancellor duke metternich and these delegates who who were the representative of those who beat napoleon they made treaty of vienna in 1815 and what were their uh, objective that is they just want to undo all the changes which were done in europe during the napoleonic war that is whatever napoleon has done or has forced this has to be undone like is like the bourbon dynasty of uh, france actually it was been disposed by french revolution they restored it they restored them to the power and the Fra france has to lose lot of uh, territories which were annexed by whom napoleon and also there were boundaries being set up so that france cannot uh, expand further that is the kingdoms of netherland that included belgium it was set up in the north 
uh, of uh, France and Genoa, North and Genoa, and Genoa was added to the Piedmont in the south. These were just, you know, made so that the French should not expand. And Prussia was also given certain territories which were very important in the western frontiers, while Austria was given control of northern Italy. But there was a German confederation of 39 states. This was being set up by Napoleon. This was not been abolished. This was kept like that. And uh, Russia was given also a part of Poland. Uh, Prussia was given a portion of Saxony. The main idea was they need, they all want to restore the monarchies. That is the emperor or king rule that has been overthrown by Napoleon. Because all these treaty of Vienna people, they wanted a new conservative order in Europe. And the conservative regime, it was set up in 1815, were autocratic. That is, they were very, they, they cannot tolerate any kind of criticism against them, any kind of dissent. They, they just uh, stopped it. And most of them imposed the censorship. This is a picture that everyone or some see the good minded people, they are sitting and they are having their mouth closed. That is, they cannot speak. So, if these, uh, these uh, governments, you can say, or the rulers, they impose censorship on the newspaper, books, plays, songs. Because if any of these contain the idea of liberty and freedom, they need to be stopped. Because French Revolution ideas were still flowing. And all these uh, memories of uh, revolution, everyone has in their mind. So, there were people who wanted so many things. They were, they were called as revolutionaries after that. And they wanted, first thing was, they wanted freedom of the press. So, who were the revolutionaries? How this uh, thing took place? We'll talk about a man called Giuseppe Mazzini. So, uh, in this, uh, these years which followed 1815, because the government they don't take the criticism or dissent, there were so certain secret societies being made up and they have all the revolutionary ideas and they wanted to spread these ideas. And what were their commitment? Their commitment to oppose the monarchical form and that has been established by whom? The Treaty of uh, Vienna, Vienna Congress. Because all of them, the revolutionaries, they have an idea that they need to fight for the liberty and freedom. So, they uh, created, they also these revolutionaries that the, in order to create the nation states, because they have this idea very clear in their mind of nation states, this is the part of their struggle for freedom. And as I said, one of them was Italian revolutionary Giuseppe Mazzini. He was born in Genoa in 1805, 1807. He became a member of secret society of Khan. Carbonari and since he was just 24 because he in, in uh, he was sent to an exile. Why? Because he was in 1813 he was supposed to attempt a revolution in Liguria. So he was sent just to uh, exile. Then he founded two major underground. These are these has to be underground because, because the monarchs or the people who are ruling they don't want people to speak. So they have to have underground societies. First, Young Italy in Marseille and then Young Europe in Bern, whose members were like-minded. Uh, young men from Poland, France, Italy also and the German states, they, they joined them. So, Mazzini has uh, this idea that God has intended nations to be natural united units of mankind. That is, they need to have, everyone has to have their own nations. So, this Italy, Italy, because he was from Italy, they don't, he don't want that patchwork that this small state, this kingdom should be added, this state has to be removed. So, they want that there has to be a single unified republic uh, with wider alliance of different nations. And this unification can only be the idea they have in mind that is liberty. So, that this can be only the basis of Italian, Italian liberty. And after that, various societies in Germany, France, Switzerland, Poland were also set up. And because of the, because of the relentless uh, opposition by Mazzini, Metternich, if you, if you uh, remember him, he was the chancellor of Hungary. Hungary, he said, 
that this is Mazini, this guy is the most dangerous enemy of our social order. Now, the age of revolutions from 1830 to 1840 48, we are talking about around 18 years. So, what happened here? As we already saw, the conservatives or conservatives, those uh, Rudiwadi, these regimes, they tried to consolidate their power. But liberalism and nationalism, liberalism we have already seen, that is those who have ideas of freedom, equality and nationalism is the love for the country, for the region, for the people, for the culture. And these came to be increasingly associated with the revolution, various parts of Europe like Italian and German states, the provinces of Ottoman Empire, Ireland and Poland. And this was led by whom? This was led by the educated middle, uh, middle class elite, that is professors, school, te school teachers, clerks, members of the commercial middle classes. And this started, the first one started in France in July 1830. The Bourbon kings who have been restored by the conservatives to the power uh, after the reaction of 1815, they were now overthrown by these liberal revolutionaries. And they installed a constitutional, see the here is a constitutional monarchy. The monar monarchy is there, but it is constitutional with Louis Philippe. And Metternich, the Hungarian chancellor, he said once at that time, that whenever France sneezes, means the ripples in the wave goes to Europe also. That is the rest of the Europe also catches cold. One more thing happened because uh, the... July Revolution, it sparks, uh, sparked an uprising in Brussels also. That is Brussels uh, is uh, in Be Belgium. So, Belgium broke away from Netherlands. Right? So, the event, there is a very important event that is the Greek War of Independence and this event mobilized, you can say, the national feeling among all the educated elite across the Europe. Now, this Greece, Greece has been a part of Ottoman Empire since the 15th century. And because the revolutionary nationalism idea was going on or growing, there was a struggle for independence among the Greece now or Greek people, which began in 1821. Those who were living in exile, the nationalists, they are also supporting this. And also the Western European, because they believe in the Greek culture, the great ancient Greek culture, they believed in this. So they also have sympathies. And others like the poet, artist, all others who believe in culture, they also help to support the, because they are mobilizing the public opinion. Because they think and they have an idea that Greek and Greece, they have a struggle against Muslim empire. I'll tell you about the Muslim empire uh, by a picture. It is basically the Turks or Turkey. They, this Muslim empire, we are talking about them. Here is Lord Brian. He was a, he was a poet. Now he organized fun, even went to the war, but he died because of fever in 1824. And finally, Greece got his in, uh, its independence by the Treaty of Constantinople of 1832. So there was an idea, romantic idea or love idea, love imagination and national feeling. So we can't just say that nationalism only uh, uh, prospered or spread just because of the expansion, wars, killing, etc. No. The culture also played a very important role for creating or uh, spreading this idea of nation, that is the region, the people. That is art, poetry, stories, music, all the, all these combined, uh, they, they um, shape the national feelings. So, if you see the romanticism, there were romantic artists who, uh, the poets, they actually, you know, because there was a middle class elite people educated, but the romantic artists and poets, they criticized, that is, the why you are reasoning, they should not be reasoning, they should not be science. But everything should be, be focused on love, emotion, intuition and the mystical feeling. 
that is we share collective heritage common past and that should be the basis of nation that is the culture the art the the uh, thing which we all have in common should be the basis of nation this these uh, things are being thought by these artists and poets okay those you can say those romanticism theory so this is the picture i was about to show you about these are the turks and this these are especially the women and uh, kids being shown and this is the idea of uh, the delacroix he wanted to uh, portray the massacre at kios so this uh, island of kios this happened and around 20000 greeks were killed by turks or turkey people so this is how the idea of uh, nationalism idea of emotions etc uh, to gain or to create the sympathy for the greeks this picture helped and there were a number of pictures this is german this is one of them we if when we go to german german philosopher john uh, gottfried herder he claimed that the true german culture was to be discovered among these common people that is das walk and the spirit of nation from folk songs poetry dances that is the walkist this was uh, popularized right so these idea collection and recording of this folk culture this these are essential according to these kind these philosophers that is the idea should be there for projection of the nation building they have a uh, idea that the language that is the vernacular language or the regional language should be popularized and the folk should be the uh, should recover the ancient national spirit and also will carry forward the national message specifically to to those mostly illiterate because picture uh, songs they can be understood by illiterate uh, illiterates not other things if you take an example of poland see poland was being partitioned at the end of 18th century by the great powers russia prussia and austria so poland uh, didn't have the uh, the independent territory but there was music there was language uh, carol Kurpinski. He celebrated the national struggle through opera, through music, and then he also, the, you know, turning folk dances like the like the polonaise and mazurka into national symbols. So he he helped it. So how the Polish people or Polish artists they kept the idea or they spread the idea by music, by dance, by other cultures. as a national they made them as national symbols and the language is also not uh, very far language also played a very important role in developing the nationalist sentiments we'll take again an example of uh, poland so when russia uh, has occupation polish language was uh, forced out of school that is the russian language needs to be they they were polish people were forced to learn this language right and there was rebellion but it was being crushed by russian so the member of the clergy that is the elite people of poland they used their, their polish language as the weapon of national resistance that is um, in the church gathering or religious instruction polish were polish language was used and they were sent to jail also and some were sent to siberia but the use of uh, this language was the poland or polish people symbol for the russians that this is our uh, means for the struggle that was against the russian dominance then it was all hunger hardship and popular revolt we will see that is in 1830s it was a year, these are the years of great economic hardship that is the population was too much increasing and the jobs were not there there were over crowded slums because people don't have place to uh, stay because they have come to the urban areas and also the imports from england which are coming england was already industrially uh, well well equipped that is industrial revolution because of this england was producing good stuff and uh, you can say cheap stuff so it started coming to europe and in europe these stuff or these textiles they were made in homes and they have very small workshop so they cannot compete with the english stuff or england uh, textile so everyone you know 
essentially you can say they got jobless and the rise of food price also uh, the bad harvest all added to the uh, hunger and hardship so in uh, the year 1848 was one of the one of this year because the food shortage unemployment the population of paris came on the road and the barricades were erected and louis philippe was forced to flee then national assembly it came into action these this is the peasants uprising picture of 1848 so the national assembly proclaimed republic and also gave the voting right above 21 years of age and also guaranteed that uh, employment will be there through right to work and also various national workshops were being set up but earlier in 1845 weavers in uh, silesia they they also revolted again con uh, against the contractors because the contractor would give them raw material but when the finished material they take they give very small payments so it was all you know started on 4 june 2 pm large crowd of viewers they just went and they just they were very uh, you can say in peace at that time they just wanted to talk but they went and they were badly treated they just went inside broke everything which came into Uh, their in in their way like the window panes furniture porcelain and they just took the cloth out of the storehouse and just shredded them and the contractor has to has to run away but nobody would give him shelter in the nearby village also so by the help of army he returned after 24 hours and then after you know what happens to these viewers to poor people yes of course this happened 11 viewers were shot after this shot dead and if you see that this uh, uprising or poor employed unemployed starving peasants they were they were fighting they were revolting but on the other side there were one more revolution going on this was by educated middle class events of february 1848 in france had bought about the abdication of the monarch and a republic based on universal male suffrage this has been proclaimed by the other side of the revolt which was taking place and there are other other parts of europe where still the nation states were not there like germany italy poland and austro hungarian empire the men and women of this liberal middle class they tried to combine their Uh, demands with the constitutionalism that is for national unification they also want that constitutionalism uh, should also be there and they saw all this they were aware of this uprising by the poor unemployed and starving peasant so they they added their idea with this present unrest that is they added the idea of a constitution the freedom of press and the freedom of association if you see in german region large number of political association Uh, of whose members were middle class professionals businessmen and prosperous artisans they came together in the uh, frankfurt city and they decided to vote for all german national assembly and this is the national assembly we are talking about this is the picture and uh, these are you know members sitting here making the constitution so these people these were say all german national assembly was proclaimed and on 18 may 1848 that picture shows that 831 elected representatives in a festive procession they came that uh, in the frankfurt parliament in the church of saint paul and they also drafted a constitution and a monarch will be subjected to head it so when they tried to uh, offer this to uh, frederick wilhelm at that time for the king of prussia this guy he rejected he said no he just joined the monarchs to oppose the elected assembly right and while this opposition of aristocracy and military it became stronger this parliament has nothing do, to do it just eroded and because the uh, parliament has lot of people or many people who resisted the demands of workers and artisan they have to they have to lose their support and finally the troops were called and this assembly was nowhere to be found it was just disbanded so the issue of extending this political right for women also took place because women were there 
women were women were were always there they found their political association you know founded newspaper and also taking parts in different demonstration etc but despite that they were denied they were denied the suffrage that is they can't vote even if you see in this picture these are the women just standing as observers they have nothing to do in in decision making they were just as observers sitting in the visitors gallery so now the conservative that is the rudiwadis the uh, the forces were able to suppress liberal movement that is the conservatives they suppressed the liberal movement now they could not restore the previous old order because monarchs they understood that these people are going to revolt and we are going to uh, repress then they 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 are going to revolt again so there will be a cycle so if this cycle goes in on and on this uh, revol revolution repression this cycle will go on and on for that what we, we need to do they have to give concessions to the liberal nationalist revolutionaries and it happened the autocratic monarchies of central and eastern europe they introduced the change the serfdom that is the dasatva uh, people who are working as bonded laborers and those who were not being paid just they are working so this was being abolished both in russia also in uh, habsburg dominions and also the habsburg ruler they granted more autonomy swayatta to the hungarians uh, hungarians in 1867 the making of uh, germany and italy so we will talk how this germany italy and also england united kingdom how these three came into existence first we'll start with the first one that is uh, as a for, as a background we are talking about germany can the army be the ar architect of a nation so if you see that the nationalism after 1848 in europe moved away from its association with democracy and revolution that is the nationalism which has in its mind democracy and revolution it somewhat moved away it only became the idea to promote the power and also to achieve the domination uh, political domination over the europe and if you see the germany in italy how they became the unified na nation state we have already seen that in the middle class germans there were national feelings widespread they tried to unite uh, different regions uh, in the form of general german confederation and into a nation nation state governed by the elected parliament and also the liberal initiative to nation building it was just repressed it was being crushed by the monarch and the military and also it was supported by large land owners of prussia so now this cannot be done so who did this prussia prussia or prussia took the leadership of the movement of unification of national unification so the chief minister of prussia otto von bismarck he uh, took the initiative and he was the architect of this process and he used the prussian army and bureaucracy for 7 years three wars with austria denmark and france he won that is prussia won and this completed the process of unification of the country so in uh, january 1871 the prussian king the picture also shows that the prussian king william 1 was proclaimed the german emperor here is the picture of the ceremony held at versailles so this is how the representative of the army important prussian minister including the chief minister uh, which was otto von bismarck they gathered in the hall of mirrors in the palace of versailles and the 
German Empire is headed by Kaiser William I of Prussia. Now, this uh, nation building of Germany, this shows Prussian dominance. Prussia, uh, the new uh, state, you can say new state, there was long or strong emphasis on the modernization of the currency, the banking, legal and judicial system. And this model, Prussian model, it became for this practice and measures the Prussian took, this became model for the rest of the Germany. When we just talked about the unification of Germany, now how did you, Italy unify? But before uh, we go ahead, let us see the uh, map of the different regions of which were uh, under Prussia and others. That is, this is the area which, which shows Prussia or Prussia before 1866. These are the, in yellow ones, these are conquered by Prussia in Austro-Prussian War in 1866. And this greenish, this is the Austrian territories excluded from German Confederation 1867. And this light green, these are the light green, they join with Prussia to form German Confederation. Then we have this pink one. These are South German states joining with Prussia to form German Empire in 1871. And this, these are the region. These are won by Prussia in Franco-Prussian War. Now what happened to Italy? How does this unification take place or took place? Now let me show you a picture. See, this Italy was divided into various parts if you see this is Savoy Sardinia and we have Lombardy, Venetia, Parma, Modena, Tuscany, uh, Papal State and these are the both the kingdoms of Sicils. This is 1858 Italian states before unification and this is the uh, Italian state after the unification. So how did this happen? Let us see about that. As we just saw how this German unification took place, Italy, uh, on the other hand, it was also scattered. There were various uh, dynastic states. As well, they have, there are, are multinational Habsburg Empire also. And if you see, at that time, during the middle of 19th century, Italy was actually divided into seven states. And these seven states, only one was Italian princely state, which was Sardinia Piedmont. North was under Austrian Habsburgs, and the center was ruled by Pope, and southern were under domination of Bourbon kings of Spain. Not even Italian language was common, and there were regional and local variations in Italy. So during the 1830s, if, it, if you uh, recall, there was a revolutionist, Giuseppe Mazzini. He put together a program for uniting or unitary Italian Republic. As we learned already that he formed Young Italy uh, Association for uh, completing his goals. But the, there was, there, these all were failures. The failure of revol revolutionary uprising both in 1831 and 1848. Now who is going to do that? This unification, who is going to do that? It was by, because only one princely state was there. So Sardinian uh, Piedmont under the rule of King Victor Emmanuel II. Now he has to do the unification. So this is because all they thought, everyone thought that the possibility of development uh, and uh, dominance in terms of economy and politis, politically dominance, it can only be achieved through this by unification. Now, Chief Minister Cavour, you have to, uh, you know, this word is going to come again, this name is going to come again. So, he was the Chief Minister who led this movement. But, uh, to your surprise, Cavour was neither a revolutionary, he was neither a democrat also. But, like, and, and also he, he can't, he just speak little, little Italian. He was he's speaking French, mostly. But, he did something. He did a very tactful diplomatic alliance with France and, and Sardinian Pidman 
succeeded by this defeating the Austrian forces in 1859. And also various uh, volunteers along with these troops, they uh, under, under the leadership of uh, Giuseppe Garibaldi, they joined this uh, fight or this war. And they, in 1860, they also entered the two Sicils and they also uh, won it with the help of support of local peasants. And in 1861, Victor Emmanuel, he was proclaimed the king of United Italy. And mostly this uh, population, they were normally, you know, illiterate. They didn't even know uh, who supported this Gar uh, Garibaldi. They didn't, didn't even know what is Italia. They believed that this La Italia is Victor Emmanuel's wife. This is very, you know, you can say, ironic you can say. But the case of Britain was different. See, Britain was arguably at that time the most, uh, the nation was a nation state and this was presented as an example. But the Britain was, you know, was not the result of sudden upheaval or revolution. It's a very long, it, it took a long time and process. That is, there was no British nation prior to 18th century. So there was, prior to 18th century, there was, there were no uh, British nation. So there were four ethnic ones, means the ethnics are, they are related to common racial, tribal and cultural region or background that a community identifies with or claims. So, four ethnic groups were there. First was English. Then there were Welsh. Then Scot. That is Scottish from South Scotland and Irish from Ireland. Irish you can say. Now, English did what? They took each of them very subtly and very gradually. We'll talk about this in a detail now. First was first to be taken over was there was a, uh, because the English Parliament it already has succeeded to uh, take the power from monarchy in 1688, and the British all all in this all the the ethnic ones the British were having wealth, importance, and power. So after this, the instrumentation through this nation state with England, this can be put into place. So first was the Scotland. There was an act of union between English and Scotland. So this formed United Kingdom of Great Britain. And this started the English influence on Scotland. That is mostly the parliament has British and the the identity of Scotland's distinctive culture or political institutions they were suppressed. British they suppressed it, and also the Catholic clans they suffered a terrible rep uh, repression because they inhabited the Scottish Highland, and also the Scottish Highlanders they were just stopped or forbidden to speak their Gaelic language. They were uh, stopped from wearing the national dress, all these, and mostly. Th forcefully driven out of the land. So this is how English took control on the Scotland. Then come the Irish, these Irish. Okay. Irish had, they also have this similar fate because Irish were divided into two parts, means two, you can say Catholics and Protestants. Christian uh, following these are. But the, in this uh, Ireland, there were more Catholics than the Protestants. But English helped the Protestants. And Catholics tried to revolt, but they were suppressed. And after a failed revolt led by Wolf Ton and his united uh, Irishmen, Ireland was forced or forcefully incorporated in United Kingdom, UK, in 1801. And again, the same thing British culture was imposed on them, like the British flag, like the Brit uh, national anthem. And all those things. And ultimately, Ireland was also taken over. Visualizing the nation. Now, what happened in the 
Well, let me tell you about. See, what we have seen here is there were four of them. And British, by one by one, they took over all of these. Because at first, they formed something which already uh, included the Welsh. Then they took over Scotland, forming the United Kingdom of Great Britain. And finally, by proclaiming and, you know, di dividing the Catholics and Protestants, they actually gained control over the third one. So, this is how they took control of all of these. Now, the vis visualization of a nation at that time, see, this is a picture of a woman. Now, women was uh, used as allegory. Allegory when an abstract idea that is, for instance, greed, envy, freedom or liberty, if it is expressed through a living being, a person or a thing, this is called allegory. So, at that time, mostly at that time, though the personification was, means even if you have to put some idea, there has to be a pers personification. So, the nations were portrayed as female figures. This is called allegory. And uh, if you recall French Revolution, then there was a woman and whose face was used, the attributes of liberty, red cap, broken chain, and the justice women was, was blindfolded and she has, uh, you know, weighing scales. Similarly, this, uh, this kind of idea, you know, in Europe, because it, it uh, was a common region, you can say, in France, this woman was Marianne, a popular Christian name. And again, it is showing the liberty, uh, the republic, that is the red cap, tricolor and cockade. And the symbol of unity, this Marian images were also marked on coins and stamps. When it comes to Germany, this is the picture of the Germany, that is Germania. This is a picture of Germania. And this again, this has a lot of things like the oak leaves. Uh, of She is wearing a crown of oak leaves and this oak leaves for Germans was for heroism. If you see, this is the postage stamps of 1850 with the figure of Marianne representing the Republic of France. So women were used uh, as the allegory. What were the meaning of symbols we just saw? Broken chains means being freed. Uh, breast plate with eagle that means the symbol of German Empire strength. The crown of oak leaves suggest heroism. Sword is we are ready to fight. Olive branch around the sword that is we are willing to make peace. Bra black, red and gold tricolor. This is the flag of liberal nationalist in 1848. Uh, banned by the dukes of German states. And rays of rising sun like this. If you see all these are here. This the beginning of a new era. So whatever we discussed here. This is all shown here. And this is just a picture of fallen Germania and means by the picture of allegory they are or the people were able to represent their uh, ideas or their intent. This is also a picture of Germania guarding the Rhine. So in 1860 the artist Lawrence Klassen was commissioned to paint this uh, image and the German swords here it is written in this. The German, German swords protects the German Rhine. So, nationalism and imperialism. Nationalism means love for the country, making a single nation. Imperialism is making a colony or, you know, getting, increasing your region through power or anything. So, by the last uh, quarter of 19th century, this nationalism was no longer retained its idealistic liberal democratic sentiments as it was in the first half of the century because now the only thing was to go into the war and to get the get more and more areas or region this most serious source of this nationalist tension uh, it happened in europe after 1871 this the area is balkans now the balkan region has a very special uh, uh, you know geographical and ethnic variation because at the Balkans consist of modern day, uh, which we know right now, Romania, Bulgaria, Albania, Greece, Macedonia, Croatia, Bosnia, Herzegovina, Slovenia, Serbia and Montenegro. So all these were the inhabitants of this Balkan region and they are commonly known as Slavs. So Slav, uh, Slavs. Now if you see all these, all these people with different ethnicity, different, different uh, belief. And 
this a large part of these balkans were ottoman was under ottoman uh, empire but what happened there was a disintegration or this ottoman empire was broken down in the in the 19th century this ottoman empire it really wanted to modernize do some internal reforms but the it fell down ottoman empire and this gave rise to different balkan people or the different uh, parts of this balkan people to start fighting for their might and for their nation land they wanted different land and this all happened and this this led to the if you see that the biggest power that is russia and uh, germany and england and austro hungary they fought for because they were big power they they had they were je jealous of each other so they just wanted that their area or their people should get the mostly you know most uh, area so this is the fight actually this is the uh, root of what gave rise to the first world war so nationalism aligned with the imperialism led europe to disaster in 1914 we know that this is the start of first world war and still you know the idea of uh, this nationalism it went into so many people people thought about it and there were nation states being formed and the idea that society should be organized into nation state this came to be accepted as natural and universal and idea of other things like imperialism how it fed we'll talk about that later and this is how the rise of nationalism took place in the european region and this is the map just to show the uh, british empire this is the world map how and where and what these britishes how they ruled where they went and which area they conquered so this is all about this topic thank you so much take care of yourself